So um, you, as you probably heard in the pitch, I'm going to be talking today about Virtuoso Surgical um, and telling you sort of about the origin story of how did we uh, spin this technology out of a university. Um, so disclosures, uh, as I mentioned before, I'm president of both Virtuoso Surgical and a second startup called Endothea, which is a company that's commercializing a device for flexible endoscopy. And I'll mention that and show you a picture of it in my talk. Um, and then I have a number of patents to technologies that you'll see in this talk as well. So I mentioned in the in the five minute session earlier, this idea of concentric tube robots. And the, this is really what enables everything that we do at Virtuoso Surgical. It's the thing that's really special about our technology. It's that it's so small and yet you can still get this bending and elongation behavior. And these concentric tube robots are made from a collection of super elastic nitinol tubes each of which is has a curve that's shape set into the tip of it. And when you put a collection of these tubes inside one another and you twist them axially at their bases and extend them telescopically, you get this really cool motion uh, out of the device. And it's, it's so small, it's really, you know, it was inspired by looking at something like the Da Vinci robot and asking like, what's the limits in terms of miniaturizability of all of these pulleys and wires and everything. And you really can't get it down very small. If you want to go to like one millimeter, two millimeter kind of size scales, you need some other technology. So I thought, why not build the bending actuation, the ability to do bending into the structural uh, material of the device? And that's sort of what inspired this idea. So uh, rewinding just a little bit, going all the way back to the beginning. So I, I told you I'm going to say an origin story of Virtuoso. So all the way back in the beginning, this is I was in grad school back at Johns Hopkins in the early 2000s, and we were looking at steerable needles, which are these devices that you push into tissue, and the bevel tip causes the device to bend. So it's just like a wedge, and as you push it in, it wants to bend in a certain direction. And if you can control the twisting, then you can aim that uh, bevel tip where you want to go, and you can reach a desired target. So around, you know, I was working on this for my PhD work and around the same time I was watching videos like what you see in the upper right here, which is a uh, skull base surgery done through a single nostril. And I was watching surgeons uh, stuff, you know, three different tools through this tiny little nostril and try to do a dexterous procedure in the middle of the head. And those, those tools are clashing with one another and it was really difficult. And I was thinking to myself, well, surgical robots have so far been used at that time, uh, you know, Intuitive was a tiny startup company um, and computer motion existed. So there are a couple of companies doing laparoscopy, uh, but those robots were way too big and required uh, open space inside the body. And I was thinking, well, what's the next frontier of surgical robotics? It's going through these smaller openings like a nostril. Um, so then uh, I graduated, I came to Vanderbilt as a professor. And in 2008, we drew a picture that looked like this. And the idea was we'd have the surgeon at a console, very analogous to the Da Vinci console. And then we'd also have uh, you know, a smaller slave robot or patient side manipulator, as we call them, uh, as Intuitive calls them. You put the patient side manipulator at the patient, and then you in insert several instruments, so these tiny concentric tube instruments through a single nostril into the, into the skull, into the skull base. So we started building a system like that. And this is what it looked like. And there's a few different parts of it. Uh, there's the actuation unit where we have all the motors. There's the manipulators, the concentric tube manipulators themselves. We have end effectors, little tips on the end that can do cutting or tissue retraction or scraping kind of uh, maneuvers in surgery. And then there's the surgeon interface where you control the robot as the surgeon and then sensing and guidance. And so we tried to make progress on all of these fronts. I'll tell you first a little bit about the actuation unit. So we designed this system that was sort of analogous to uh, with a cartridge uh, interface, kind of like what you see in the Da Vinci, where we could bag it and keep all of our motors and electronics reusable, uh, and then have only in the sterile field have plastic components and then the concentric tubes themselves. Um, and then we, uh, so I mentioned cartridges. Here's what it looks like to insert one of those cartridges, clamp it in place. So this was the concept. Um, and it's, again, drawing inspiration from the Da Vinci. They have the same sort of uh, interface through the bag and cartridge kind of uh, tool insertion. Um, and then we worked hard on end effectors as well. We can put little grippers on the end. We can put little uh, curettes, which are scraping tools, which is bottom middle. We can put tiny little chip tip cameras on the end. And that's what you're seeing in the video in the upper left. Uh, and then we can cut notches into the tip to create almost a little miniature wrist uh, at the tip of this tiny little robot. Uh, here's um, an example of one of those tools. I'll play this video for you first. This is with a curette with one of those wrists. And so you can see we're able to bend and still get rotational 
uh, actuation out of that tool. And that lets the doctor really get that curette into the right angles in the skull base to do the scraping maneuvers they need to do for pituitary uh, surgery. So this is an example of a pituitary tumor. Pituitary is like right in the middle of the head and they get these kind of mushy tumors, they're benign. So you don't, you're not worried about spreading them, but you need to decompress them or else the patient could go blind or have other serious complications. Uh, so the, the surgeon now is using our robot to scrape out the, uh, this gelatinous material and then suction it out. Um, and you might be asking, well, why don't they just put the suction tool into that cavity itself? Well, the carotid arteries run in there just behind where you can see. And if you accidentally were to grab one of those with your suction tool and tear it, that would be a massive complication, possibly life-threatening for the patient. So they really like to use these semi-blunt curettes to do the scraping job. So that's, we, uh, that's the experiments that we run on this robot in the lab. And again, this is all in the lab at Vanderbilt. We're talking about the period from about 2008 through, uh, I don't know, maybe 2014 or so. Um, we were building sequentially better versions of this. And this is the final system where we packaged it all up into a cart that could roll around in the hospital. Uh, we had built a um, very nice surgeon console with a nice monitor and some user inputs. Uh, and then we had our robot mounted to an arm so we could actually um, hold it above the patient uh, in the OR. So we got this far, and this is really about as far as you can get in an academic setting. You can build a system that sort of looks and feels like a product, but it's not yet a product. Uh, and that's where, you know, my picture was, hey, that's where a company takes over, and we licensed this out to a big medical device company. Uh, and a large medical device, device company came calling at that time, and this was perfectly aligned with their business strategy. They wanted a robot for sinus surgery, for skull-based surgery, uh, and they, uh, they had some other nice adjunct technologies they could pair with it really nicely. We'd already shown feasibility that that could work. Um, so it was aligned really well with their business strategy and what they were looking for. And as I told them about the robot, they got more and more interested. They're like, really, these concentric tube robots, super cool, uh, very tiny. This is exactly the kind of thing we've been looking for. So the enthusiasm in the room was just really high. Uh, and then at a certain point, they started, they switched gears and other people who were on the call started asking questions about, so where are you with uh, FDA approval? I was like, guys, you know, FDA approval, that's not what we really do at universities. You have whole, you know, groups of people who are really good at that stuff. You know, I'm sure you can figure it out. And they're like, oh, well, okay. And then uh, they were asking me like, oh, well, how much does it cost to build one of these things? And I'm like, well, cost to build one versus the cost to build a whole lot. Once you get your manufacturing uh, nailed down, you're going to be able to make these very inexpensively. Uh, and they're like, well, okay, but that's not a number. It's hard for us to put that in a model. And then they were also asking me like, what does a hospital make on one of these uh, surgical procedures? How much was the reimbursement like? And can you fit a robot into it? And I'm like, hey guys, this is what you do. This is not what we do at universities as academics. Um, we do the feasibility and then you, you answer all these questions. And at some point along the way there, the uh, enthusiasm all drained out of the room. They were not getting the answers they wanted to these questions. And those discussions, despite the initial like really high enthusiasm, ended up not going anywhere. Um, so the good, I, I did a self-analysis of this. I'm like, what did we do wrong? You know, is, is this picture even right of how far you can get something into university and then commercializing it with the big medical device company? And so I thought, you know, the good is the basic idea. Obviously, they agreed with the value. They agreed with the clinical value proposition. And it certainly fit with their business directions. But the bad was I just didn't have answers for them in terms of financial value proposition, manufacturing, regulatory pathway. Uh, and then in terms of, you know, dollars, milestone timeline from this prototype you see here to a commercial product was unclear. And that just introduced too much uncertainty for them to be able to pick this up. And I began thinking about it even more. And I was like, well, uh, you know, what, why not take this on and, and do this development in a big medical device company? And would they rather spend, they probably could have licensed our patents at that time for, you know, a million bucks or less. Um, or, you know, you look at some of the acquisitions that have happened in the surgical robotics space in the last couple of years. And these companies with, you know, five to 10 systems deployed clinically are selling for one to $2 billion. So it's like, why wouldn't you rather spend a million dollars for this now rather than $2 billion for it in a couple of years? And the answer I came to is, well, you know, if you look at it from the position of an executive at one of these companies, the answer is they would rather spend the, the billions because it's proven then and they get to be the hero riding in with this great technology for their company that's going to really grow the, the bottom line versus if they take on this, uh, this risk at the beginning, the, sure, they spend a million bucks for the IP and the initial prototype, but it's going to cost them probably a hundred million to get that 
through to a product which might flop. And if it did flop, they probably lose their job. So would you rather lose your job or have the risk of losing your job? Or would you rather be a hero, even if ultimately it's going to cost your company more dollars? Uh, and the answer is they just can't take on that risk. And so that got me started thinking about, well, could we do our own startup company? And what would that look like? And how would we do it? And so I'd been working, this is Dr. Duke Harrell. He's a urologic surgeon at Vanderbilt. Uh, and he and I had been working on a lot of things. We've been looking at how do we make the Da Vinci better? We have an R01 to do that, an NIH grant to do that. We've been looking at um, all kinds of devices in the lab. And I'd been showing him uh, you know, prototypes of this robot. And he thought it over for a while and then came into the lab one day. And he's like, what we need to do is we need to do hole up with this thing. I'm like, oh, well, what? What are you talking about? What even is that surgery? So I learned about it, um, and thankfully I did because it's uh, really interesting. So HOLEP is a uh, disease, it's enlarged prostate. So it's going to happen to all of us as we get older, all the men who are listening as we get older. Um, um, you know, 90% of men in their 80s will have problems with enlarged prostate, difficulty urinating, uh, et cetera. There's 300,000 surgeries for this a year in the U.S. alone. So it's very uh, high volume market. And it just comes, you know, prostate, just the, the tissue grows and it squeezes down the urethra and you can't go to the bathroom. Um, so the, the gold standard treatment for this is called TERP, where you put in an endoscope through the urethra and you have this wire loop and you pull out little chunks of prostate tissue. But there's a better procedure called HOLEP, which is holmium laser nucleation. Nucleation just means taking uh, whole chunks of tissue rather than uh, cutting it up piecemeal of the prostate. Um, and then uh, the question was, well, which, which is better? And uh, Dr. Harrell told me, well, Holep wins on every front. It's, uh, it's cheaper to do. The reoperation rate is negligible. There's uh, no blood transfusions required. And you get out of the hospital quicker and you get the catheter out quicker. And so this is better for patients. It's better for doctors, better for the hospital system. So you would think this is done all the time. And there's six randomized controlled trials that say this. So we know this as physicians. Um, and unfortunately, that's not the case. It's done 4% of the time. And we're like, well, why is it done such a tiny percent of the time if it's known to be better? And the reason is it's really hard to do. Just like the neurosurgery example I was uh, showing you earlier, the doctor has a laser fiber in through the port of a rigid endoscope and has to use that rigid endoscope to attempt to retract tissue with the scope itself and then cut by moving the scope itself and the laser is fixed at one spot in the scope's uh, field of view. Uh, and so you can imagine this is just a really difficult thing to, uh, to be able to make the cuts in the right place and to even get your laser fiber to bear on the target you want to cut. Um, so because it's so difficult, that's the challenge. And that's why it's not more pervasive, even though we know it's better. So this creates a huge opportunity for us uh, to make, to, to do, that's why I say we're trying to, we're doing for endoscopy, what da Vinci did for laparoscopy. It's, they took a procedure that was definitely less invasive for the patient, Da Vinci did, um, and that was really hard for surgeons to learn, laparoscopy, you know, uh, hard to do manually. And they made it really easy with the robot. And so we're taking something that the best surgeons can do with an endoscope, and we're, uh, our goal is to make it easier with these concentric tube robots. So this robot you're seeing was an early prototype we had in the lab at Vanderbilt. Um, that could deliver two different um, instruments through the port in this endoscope, and we could cut out prostates and simulated, uh, you know, in trainers, trainers for hole up. So this is an example of the endoscope view you see in one of these trainers. You see the lobes of the prostate and the bladder. Um, and so this is an early video. This is probably around 2014, 2015 kind of time frame we made this video. Um, and you can see what this surgeon is doing is attempting to cut out this lower lobe. So the right hand there has a laser, which he's using to do the cutting. And then the left hand he's using now as a retractor, which he never would have had retraction to be able to open up those tissue planes before. Um, so you can see what he's doing. He's using two hands cooperatively and cutting bit by bit, cutting, getting this lobe loose. Uh, and then what you'll see uh, again is he'll eventually get it all the way loose and he'll grab it with two hands, which obviously you could never do before with a single tool, uh, pick it up and then kind of push it back into the bladder. And so that, that's a successful uh, surgery right there. And then you go back into the bladder with a morse later and you get it out um, after the fact. So that was uh, one of our very early successes in a trainer. Uh, so at this stage, we still haven't started the company, but we're uh, four PhD dissertations in. Uh, and these are the, the different people, Caleb Rucker, Hunter Gilbert, and Rich Hendrick. Rich is now chief, chief operating officer at Virtuoso. Um, and it took uh, four of our dissertations to get to this point um, with the work. So quite a bit of work. And that's that's when we founded Virtuoso Surgical. 
So the company was founded in 2016. Um, we started off-campus operations 2017, and we've raised about $10 million to date. We have about 10 employees at the company right now. Um, this is our founding team, as I've, I've mentioned, Duke Carroll, myself, Rich Hendrick, and Mark Pickrell, who is our general counselor and chief uh, administrative officer. Here's what the robot looks like that we're building at Virtuoso. So just like in the lab, I drew that picture very early on for what I wanted to build. This is what we drew when we first founded Virtuoso. So it has a lot of different pieces to it. So we have um, disposable tools. These are plastic um, uh, components on the back end of concentric tubes, which go all the way down through here, through the endoscope. So these you can change out in the middle of surgery um, and they're very low cost and disposable. And we have all our motors in this actuation unit. It gets draped and reused. We've got a standard endoscope back here with a rod lens on it that goes all the way through down into the patient. Uh, so that gives you an idea. And then this is our holding arm interface, which connects to our manipulator that's going to support this whole device. So I'll play this video. You can see we'll sort of slide along it. These uh, sheaths out at the end here are standard. So these are exactly the outer sheath uh, in particular is exactly what is used um, clinically right now today. So we're not changing what touches the patient for most of the distance at all. Uh, we're just making slight modifications to the inner sheath and then delivering concentric tube robots through it. So that's the idea. And then we suspend this thing on the end of an arm. And I, so I showed this video earlier as well. So we have um, this robot arm that does just simply gravity compensation. It just holds the device weightless so that the surgeon can reposition the endoscope as desired. Uh, and then the one thing we let it do is we let it do a little bit of axial motion on the endoscope um, using a foot pedal. But mostly this is just a passive arm that just takes the weight off and lets the surgeon reposition, makes it, makes it feel weightless, makes the endoscope feel weightless and you can reposition as you desire. So that's the system. And here's an early 2018, this is what it looked like in our lab at the company. You can sort of see how you reposition it and then you go to the user interfaces, move them around. Uh, to move the little manipulators at the tip of the device. Um, here's what the system looked like, uh, you know, about um, close to a year ago now. Looked like this, and this is getting a lot closer to what our current uh, commercialized version of the system is going to look like. Here's what the tip of it looks like with the two manipulators coming through the uh, port. Um, and I showed this video earlier. I'll show it again. Um, this is what it looks like to use. So this is the physician actually maneuvering those um, concentric tube manipulators um, in the view, field of view. And then I, uh, I also showed this maneuver, but it's really the, the coolest maneuver of the surgery when she um, gets down to the bottom of this uh, lesion and flips it over to be able to cut on the backside. That's just a really cool maneuver that would never be possible with uh, prior devices. So here's what it looks like in the lab um, at our company, draped and everything. Surgeons repositioning it, um, cutting out uh, lobes of, that, of a prostate model. And then I also wanted to show you, this is uh, very hot off the presses. We've done, this is a live animal. And we're now uh, doing a simulated surgical procedure procedure in the uterus. So this would be like you if you had a uterine fibroid and you wanted to cut into the wall uh, to get out the base of that fibroid. So this is in a live uh, animal, live porcine model, and this surgeon's cutting out like a, just a chunk of the wall to uh, to do proof of concept. So the cool thing about this is it's directly analogous to bladder tumors. So the other thing we can do with this device is we can go into the bladder and get out chunks of tissue. And that's really necessary in bladder tumors because you need to know about whether the tumor has invaded the muscle because the course of care for the patient is very diff different depending if, you, if it's muscle invasive versus non-muscle invasive. If it's not invading the muscle, you'll just watch the patient uh, very, you know, uh, not, oh, and this is really cool. So we're going to cauterize a bleeding vessel right here. So that's a really nice ability to have with this system. So yeah, so back to bladder. So um, yeah, you wanna know if it's in the muscle because if it is in the muscle, then you're gonna do really aggressive chemotherapy, possibly remove the whole bladder. So you really need to get good chunks of tissue for the surgeon to see. So that was a snare we just deployed. And so now we're grabbing onto that chunk of tissue with the, the snare grasper and cutting at the base. Um, okay. So that's the story of Virtuoso. Just to shift gears real quick, um, people always ask me, well, can you do this with flexible endoscopes? And the answer is not with the uh, concentric tube mechanism where we're twisting the tubes because uh, for technical reasons, it just doesn't work because there's a lot of torsional windup down the length of a long flexible endoscope. So a couple of years ago, um, this is Caleb Rucker, uh, who's a professor at University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And he came up with this idea of putting uh, two tubes inside one another and doing pushing and pulling 
uh, relative of the of the two tubes and you know attaching their tips to one another. And that can give you the same sort of dexterous manipulation in a flexible endoscopic package. You can make it very, very small. This is a kidney stone basket, a one millimeter diameter prototype. Uh, and then we've also made it a little bit larger and put it through a colonoscope. And this is the second startup that's come from my lab. It's Endothea Incorporated. And so we've now got a couple of these manipulators at the tip of a flexible endoscope um, to do uh, procedures in the, uh, in the colon. Uh, and then the lastly, just go back to Virtuoso and sort of answer one question ahead of time. People always wonder, well, how stiff are these things? The answer is they're really, really stiff because they're cantilevered such a short distance out of the endoscope. And so I'm showing in the upper right picture a load that's applied in the worst case direction, in the worst case configuration, we can still resist a Newton load with 2.5 millimeters deflection on this thing. And it's much, much stiffer axially or in any other direction. So these are really stiff, uh, much, much stiffer than you would think just due to the fact they're cantilevered such a short distance out of the tip of that endoscope. So with that, I will conclude the presentation and I am glad to answer any questions that anybody has. All right, looking at the chat window here, um, can those two manipulators be any tools or are they limited to grasp for a laser, et cetera? So uh, in principle, I mean, any flexible endoscopic tool that um, could be sized to around two millimeters or smaller, we could deliver um, as long as it's flexible and can be, or can be made flexible. And so what we have done so far is we've done electrosurgery probes, both, both bipolar and monopolar. Uh, we've done laser fibers. We've done um, little graspers, and then we've done these baskets to grab larger pieces of tissue that I showed you in one of those um, later videos that you saw. Uh, so I think that's the set that we've done to date. Um, in principle, if you have scissors that are you know that small, you could do scissors as well. Um, and then I guess any other tool, I mean, we can do different kinds of cautery probes. You can do hooked ones, for example, versus straight ones. Uh, all of that is possible. Um, yeah, Holep and Thulep, um, we're looking at all different laser technologies. So that's uh, absolutely um, looking at both of those. Um, and uh, yeah, and getting getting close, advancing toward market. I guess the one other thing I can say is, you know, we're, we're getting close to FDA submission. The product is not quite a design freeze yet. It's at feature freeze. So all the features that are that need to be in there for a clinical product, we think are in there now. Uh, we're looking forward to design freeze coming up in next year and then uh, FDA submissions, you know, toward the end of next year, beginning of the, the following year. Uh, how do we teach uh, potential customers? Um, do we send the unit out? So we haven't actually gotten that far yet. What we've done so far is we've brought in uh, a number of surgeons to our facility in Nashville. Um, and we've shown them the robot there. We've had them work on models similar to um, what you saw in the videos. Uh, yeah, no worries. Um, so yeah, we, we do that. Uh, what we imagine doing for our first uh, clinical sites is we imagine, yeah, sending the robot and sending members of our founding team to do initial training with them to make sure they're really comfortable with the system and set it up and all of that. Um, the use of the system is really intuitive for the physicians. So we see the physicians just walking right up to the console and immediately just intuitively knowing how to do surgery with it. Uh, so they don't need a lot of like technical training once it's set up. But of course, you need to train the uh, the OR staff, uh, the nursing staff on how to set it up um, and what to do. And then, yeah, you know, just let the physician get a little bit comfortable with it, doing a model or two, um, how the endoscope moves, how they can move back and forth between the endoscope and the surgeon console, et cetera. So, yeah, we're uh, that's what we have in mind, certainly some sort of training. But fortunately, we've designed it so that hopefully it's not um, really a lot of training that we need to do. All right. Um, well, thank you everyone for uh, coming and listening to the talk and uh, um, hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and wonderful rest of the conference.